Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's session, Succession Planning 101 for your community HIV AIDS program as part of the business day for the Division of Community HIV AIDS programs during the 2024 National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment. My name is Lieutenant Commander Tara Lemons, and I am a Project Officer, Public Health Analyst within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, Division of Community HIV AIDS Programs, and I will be serving as your moderator for today. We thank you for joining today's call. As you participate in the session, please feel free to add your questions or comments in the chat box. At the conclusion of the session, of the session, the presenters will have an opportunity to address your questions. So let's begin. Good morning and welcome to the 2024 National Ryan White Conference DCHAP Business Day. I am Lieutenant Commander Tara Lemons and am joined by my colleague, Marva Gooden. We are public health analysts, also known as project officers, within the Division of Community HIV AIDS programs, providing oversight and management to several Ryan White HIV AIDS programs Part C EIS, Part D Wiki, and Part F CBDPP, recipients in the Western region of the United States. Today, our goal is to familiarize you with the best approach to developing and implementing a succession plan for your community HIV AIDS programs. Part C, Early Intervention Services, Part D, Women, Infants, Children, and Youth, and Part F, Community-Based Dental Partnership Program. We look forward to hearing from you throughout this presentation via chat and during our Q&A session regarding the information we will go over and offer the opportunity for a few of our project directors to share their experience or experiences with succession planning and how it has benefited their organization and the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Next slide, please. This slide is an overview of HRSA's purpose. As you can see, we support more than 90 healthcare programs through the provision of more than 3,000 awards annually, reaching millions of people and their families all of whom may be geographically isolated, economically or medically challenged to access quality care. Next slide, please. Given the rapid changes in healthcare over the past year, the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the U.S. Initiative and the work to update in Haas, we embrace the opportunity to revisit and refresh HAB's vision and mission. The updated vision for our HRSA HAB is to provide optimal HIV care and treatment for all to end the HIV epidemic in the U.S. This update acknowledges the goal of ending HIV epidemic in the U.S. and what HAB needs to do to get there while continuing to provide quality HIV care that currently and newly diagnosed people with HIV need. We have updated our mission that reads, provide leadership and resources to advance HIV care and treatment to improve health outcomes and, health and reduce health disparities for people with HIV and affected communities. The mission represents our organizational focus to work towards achieving the vision. It is important to acknowledge that we cannot achieve our vision and mission without the support of all of you who are carrying out the critical work each day. Next slide, please. So this slide shows, provides a comprehensive system, just so you know, uh, HRSA, and the Ryan White HIV AIDS program provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medications, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. 
We fund grants to state, cities, counties, and local community-based organizations to improve health outcome and reduce HIV transmission. We have provided services to over 566,000 people. That was in 2022. More than half of the people diagnosed with HIV in the U.S. And of those, 89% 89.6% of the Ryan White clients receiving HIV medical care were virally suppressed in 2022, which exceeded the national average of 65.1. This mean, means that they cannot sexually transmit HIV to their partners and can live longer, healthier lives. Next slide, please. So this is our disclaimer statement. Next slide, please. All right, so now we move into the purpose and learning objectives. The purpose of this presentation is to provide technical support to support current Ryan White HIV AIDS program, Part C, D, and F dental recipients. So let us review our four learning objectives. First, our goal is to uh, make sure that, or at least help you, be able to have a uh, better recognition and understanding um, to be able to discuss the importance of having an up-to-date plant succession plan in place. Secondly, uh, our goal is for you to be able to describe and identify the steps to developing an organization-specific succession plan. Thirdly, we're hoping that you will be able to identify succession, successful succession planning resources. And then fourthly, hopefully you will walk away with a actual draft of a succession plan in hand by the end of this presentation. We've invited three Ryan White HIV AIDS, community HIV AIDS recipients to share the challenges of not having a plan in place, as well as experience and knowledge gained from implementing and maintaining a, su a succession plan to ensure continuity of HIV care and treatment services. Next slide, please. Are there any track and field fans who recognize what is happening in this photo? It appears to be a smooth handoff from one leader to the next, right? Of course, the ultimate goal is to win by maintaining pre-planning practice, communication, and execution effortlessly. This is what succession planning should mimic. The first reason for succession planning is to ensure continuity of the organization's program operations and ensure optimal care and treatment are not compromised if and when. So it's not a matter of if, because it will happen. Key staff depart unexpectedly. So our first point is continuity. Having a succession plan in place ensures a smooth transition of leadership within an organization, preventing disruption in operations when there is a change in key personnel. Next, we have risk management. Succession planning is important for risk management. It helps mitigate risk associated with unexpected departures of key personnel or key employees by having suitable replacements ready. Then we have talent, talent development. Talent development fosters a culture of continuous learning and development within the organization, identifying and grooming high potential employees for future leadership roles, not only prepares them for advancement, but also boosts employee morale and engagement. Another popular reason for succession planning is maintaining institutional knowledge. Effective succession planning helps preserve vulnerable institutional knowledge and expertise. It ensures that, it, that crucial information and skills are passed down from one generation of leaders to the next preventing the loss of critical historical knowledge. Then we move on to retention and engagement. Succession planning is helpful in retention and engagement because knowing employees knowing that there are opportunities 
for growth and advancement within an organization can increase their loyalty and motivation. Employees are more likely to stay with an organization that invests in their development and provides clear pathways for career progression. Lastly, succession planning allows organizations to identify and nurture individuals with the skills and qualities needed to lead an ever-changing business environment through adaptability and innovation. It promotes diversity, of thought and innovation by ensuring a steady influx of fresh perspectives and ideas into leadership positions. So later on, or actually now you can start uh, adding comments to the chat. We'd like to hear insight from your perspective on what is at risk if this handoff is not completed smoothly. Please note your thoughts for discussion during the Q&A session. Again, you may go ahead and already place those in the chat. Next slide, please. All right, so now that we know why succession planning is necessary, let us talk about who's responsible. The project director or program manager, these are usually the persons uh, responsible for identifying and developing talent within their teams. They play a critical role in assisting employee potential, providing feedback, and creating opportunities for growth and ad advancement. Then there's the authorizing official or business official or your senior leadership team. Senior leaders play a critical role in identifying potential successors grooming talent, and ensuring that the organization has a robust pipeline of future leaders. They may also be involved in succession planning for their own positions. Then there are the managers and the employees themselves who are also key participants in succession planning, especially for their career development. They may engage in training and development activities, seek feedback from managers, and pursue opportunities to gain new skills and experiences. In summary, succession planning is a collaborative effort that involves various stakeholders across the organization. Effective succession planning requires strong communication, collaboration, and commitment from all parties involved. Next, let's consider who are the real beneficiaries of a successful succession plan. Obviously, leadership benefits. There's a continuity of leadership and smooth transition when key executives retire, resign, or face unforeseen for circumstances. This stability is crucial for maintaining Ryan White HIV AIDS program's effectiveness. Next, the employees. A clear succession plan provides employees with a roadmap for career advancement. It fosters a sense of security and motivation as they see opportunities for growth within the organization. The stakeholders, your stakeholders, such as community partners. This may include subrecipients, local and state health departments, persons with lived experience and their families, community-based organizations, as well as other stakeholders. They are assured that the organization has a plan in place to mitigate risk associated with the leadership changes. They can help maintain confidence and stability in the program and the organization, which is what is important, certainly, for our stakeholders. They need to believe in you and your program or the organization and its program. So having a successful succession plan in place uh, is going to alleviate some of those fears and help them feel more secure. Then there's the customers or the clients. Uh, continuity and leadership ensures consistent delivery of services, maintaining trust and satisfaction. Clients benefits benefit from a seamless transition that minimizes disruptions. And then, of course, the organization culture benefits. Succession planning reinforces the organization's commitment to nurturing talent from within. It promotes a culture, culture of development and loyalty among employees, which can contribute overall moral and retention. So it's a win-win. 
for everyone. Next slide, please. So this slide, slide nine, remember actual succession, succession plans can vary widely depending on the organization's size, size area, such as urban or uh, rural areas, and specific needs. This diagram provides a basic framework to get started. So the first thing we want to do, or we encourage folks to do, is to look at your key positions. Identify critical vulnerable positions within the organization that require succession planning. This may include executive roles, key management positions, and other critical roles. Let us not forget that communication and engagement are essential in the process by aiding in developing strategies for building and maintaining a robust talent line. I, excuse me, talent pipeline to ensure a steady supply of potential successors for key positions. So again, you wanna encourage that open dialogue, feedback and participation and development opportunities to foster that culture of talent development and succession readiness. Secondly, you wanna develop some required job competencies. Outline the individual um, development plans for each potential successor to help them acquire the skills and experience needed for future roles. This may include training programs, mentoring, stretch assignments, and or educational opportunities. Define the criteria that com and competencies required for success in each key position. This may include technical skills, leadership skills, industry and knowledge, uh, and other relevant factors. So now that you've developed your uh, required job competencies, look at your talent pipeline. Describe the strategies for building and maintaining a robust, robust talent pipeline to ensure a steady supply of potential successors for key positions. This may include talent acquisition initiatives, leadership development programs, and succession planning discussions during performance reviews. Fourth, we look at potential successors. Identify those persons within the organization for each key position based on performance, potential, and alignment with succession criteria. Include information such as their current roles, what are their current strengths, what are their development needs, and readiness for promotion. This includes contingency plans to address unexpected leadership vacancies or disruptions, identify backup successors, and ensure they are prepared to step into key roles if needed, minimizing the impact of unexpected transitions. Fifth, you wanna create an action plan, monitoring and adjusting as needed. So describing how the succession plan will be monitored and evaluated for effectiveness is key. Include key metrics, milestones, and processes for reviewing and adjusting the plan as needed to ensure alignment with organizational goals and priorities. Six, summarize. Six is uh, evaluating effectiveness. So here, I'll summarize some key points and emphasize the importance of succession planning as a strategic priority for the organization's long-term success. So this template provides a basic structure for developing a succession plan. Organizations can customize it to, to suit your needs, suit their specific needs, goals, and circumstances. Now, let's do a deeper dive into what each step entails as we continue. Please place any questions in the chat for discussion with our recipient panel. Next slide, please. All right, so getting started. Developing a succession plan involves several key steps to identify, develop, and retain organization talent. Again, identifying those key positions, which positions are key or critical to the organization's success, to the program success, to the Ryan White program success. Um, that, in my mind, would be the program managers, the project directors, the medical directors, the um, perhaps you know case managers. Uh, those persons, the data entry, and let us not forget our all-valued uh, fiscal budget analyst folks. Um, 
So these are typically, you know, again, the executive roles and some of the roles that I've just mentioned. Secondly, you want to create a development plan. So what type of training plans or programs do you have available for your employees within your organization? Do you offer mentoring opportunities? Do you offer job rotations or even job shadowing? Um, what about stretch assign assignments? Having some person fill in for you or serve as an acting um, program director while you're away. Um, then thirdly, look at build building that talent pipeline. Once potential successors are identified, you create those ident uh, individualized development plans to help them acquire the skills and experience needed for future roles. There may be community training programs, there may be organization leadership programs available. Encourage those uh, potential successors to perhaps sign up for those programs. Next, uh, sorry, hold on. In assessing current talent, <laughs> this may involve performance reviews. So certainly doing your performance reviews with employees, um, talk about some of the um, skills, their goals, their dreams with regards uh, to the organization and to serving um, within the Ryan White HIV AIDS programs. And if they are really motivated, certainly we want to foster and support that growth in whatever way we can. Next slide, please. So while we're starting or continuing to get started, you want to look at uh, establishing uh, succession criteria. So defining the criteria and competencies required for success in key positions and using them to assess potential successors. You want to create an action plan. So now that you've identified them, you got an action plan, help them to acquire the skills necessary. And then lastly, again, you're going to evaluate. Next slide, please. Ah, taking a look at the data. It's important to understand that succession planning is not limited to federal agencies. It is a key component within our professional and personal lives. So again, we're, we're not, this is not something that um, we decided, oh, our recipients are in need of some succession plans in place. This is a technique that should be taking place across our nation within all organizations. So based on this report, we know that succession planning activities are not being addressed and limited succession planning is a frequent occurrence across health agencies across the nation. Next slide, please. Does anyone remember this phrase? Ah, the great resignation is a phrase that was coined as the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded. Quit rates increased as the pandemic peaked in 2021, as illustrated in this slide. Some organizations are still recovering from the high rates of staff turnover. So before I turn the presentation over to my colleague, Marva, let us do a brief knowledge check. Please respond via the chat feature to the following three questions. True or false? During times of shifting leadership and change, succession planning helps the organization to ensure business continuity and performance. True or false? I'll read it again. During times of shifting leadership and change, succession planning helps the organization to ensure business continuity and performance. Is that statement true or false? All right, next statement, true or false. Giving, seri giving serious consideration to an employee who lacks personal drive, commitment, knowledge, and training is the best person to consider when looking to develop your talent pipeline. Is that statement true or false? I'll read it again. Giving, given serious consideration to an employee who lacks personal drive, commitment, knowledge, and training is the best person to consider when looking to develop your talent pipeline. 
All right. Please place your, your responses in the chat. Here's the last one, true or false. Is it a best practice to leverage positions, not people? In other words, is there a benefit to focusing on qualified positions rather than people? Is that true or false? All right, so we'll talk about this um, during our audience participation or during our Q&A session at the end. Next slide, please. I wanna thank you for your participation. I will now turn the presentation over to my esteemed colleague, Marva Denton. Thank you, Commander Lemons, and good morning, everyone. All right, let's create a draft succession plan. The first step is to identify critical and vulnerable positions within the organization. At the recipient level, this is the program manager, the project director, principal investigator, fiscal and budget uh, analyst, and authorizing official. In addition to the roles listed on the slide, other critical vulnerable positions may be the HR director, the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, the clinic manager, the careware data entry staff, especially if only one team member has this responsibility. And of course, the case management staff. This is why the awesome DCHAP project officer is constantly reminding you that the EHB user roles be updated frequently. This is a crucial responsibility of the authorizing official, the project director, the principal investigator or program manager. This is not an exhaustive uh, list of critical vulnerable positions. Please feel free to utilize the resource succession planning step-by-step -step guide shared in the chat to develop a succession plan tailored to the specific needs of your program. Next slide, please. This table from the sample resource tool shared via the chat is available online at the National Institutes of Health's Office of Human Resources website. It is designed to help you determine which positions in your organization are in most need of succession planning and to help you track your succession planning progress. Follow the steps in the table to determine the most vulnerable and critical positions, then prioritize your succession planning efforts accordingly. Next slide, please. Think about who are the strong performers within the program who has the drive, motivation, and commitment to excel in the key roles that will contribute to the overall success of the program. Part of risk management uh, would urge you to ask, what are some of the core competencies that should be tailored to your specific program, organization, and service area? Next slide, please. The second step is to develop required job competencies in the process of completing your outline. You will create a profile identifying potential successors for each key position based on performance and alignment with your succession criteria. Okay. It's time for audience participation. Please place in the chat any requirements needed for a successor for your position or at least one requirement for any key position within your organization. It is important to think about the requirements necessary for the successor of key positions. Here are some key data 
points to consider when it comes to necessary requirements. Think about years of service requirements. Does someone need to be with the organization X number of years before they are eligible for promotion from within? How does your organization determine readiness? Is there a mentoring program? Are there opportunities to shadow key staff? Uh, maybe function as the boss for the day? Are there leadership training opportunities? Consider current role strengths. What are some strengths you had when you took your position? For vulnerability and criticality, is the position crucial for continuity of care and service delivery to clients? Is the position crucial to maintaining ongoing day-to-day -day program operations? Consider your employee onboard count and requirement eligibility. Who may be retiring soon? Do you know when they will be retiring? Next slide, please. This slide provide tips on identifying the talent pipeline. Start by looking at positions that are well-suited to temporarily transition into the successor position should a vacancy arise. These staff members may also be qualified to apply for the successor position when the vacancy announcement is posted. This will have you well positioned to fill vacancies quickly. The individual's annual performance review may be a good time to assess their readiness to fill key roles. The annual performance review may also be an opportunity to outline individualized development plans for potential successors. Some questions to consider as you explore your talent pipeline. What are the best aligned duties between two positions? Does positions have similar day-to-day -day experiences in the functional areas and tasks performed for the successor role? What are the gaps between the two roles? Does the position cultivate the core competencies needed to perform the successor role? During our Q&A session, we have invited our recipient panel to share some examples of their training programs and or educational opportunities, to share any mentoring opportunities or opportunities to uh, shadow key staff, stretch assignments and detail. These would be opportunities to learn and grow outside current work responsibilities. Next slide, please. Define the criteria and competencies. Look at technical skills. Is the individual a team player? Are they self-motivated? I won't read the entire slide. This pipeline, this template, sorry, let me read that again. This template is available in the resource tool shared in the chat. Next slide, please. The next presenter is going to discuss in more detail how important it is to create a developmental plan for potential successors, which helps to identify meaningful growth opportunities. Learning and development opportunities may help you create a succession development plan, but it is also important to ask the incumbent to identify opportunities for the successor as well. Staff development opportunities may include 
creating a succession development plan with training and learning opportunities, again, mentoring and coaching opportunities, acting for the incumbent while they are away from, from work, working on special projects or opportunities to stretch skills into aligned areas. The creation of the action plan should not be done in isolation. It is important to involve members of the leadership team and other key staff in order to foster a culture of talent development and succession readiness. Next slide, please. The next presenter is going to discuss in more detail how important it is to create a developmental plan for potential successors, which helps to identify meaningful growth opportunities. Learning and development opportunities may help you create a succession development plan, but it is also important to ask the incumbent to identify opportunities for the successor as well. Staff development opportunities may include creating a succession development plan with training and learning opportunities, mentoring and coaching opportunities, acting for the incumbent while they are away from work, working on special projects or opportunities to stretch skills into aligned areas. The creation of the action plan should not be done in isolation. It is important to involve members of the leadership team and other key staff to foster a culture of development and succession readiness. Next slide, please. As you can see by this slide, which is our sixth step, succession planning is not linear. It is a continuous process that is part of the organization's strategic planning. Next slide, please. At the end of the presentation, we will have a live Q&A session where we will hear from our esteemed recipient panel who will discuss the questions on this slide with respect to their individual experience with succession planning. Next slide, please. These resources and some sample documents have been shared in the chat. Please feel free to use them as a guide in developing your succession plan. Next slide, please. The recipient panelists are Jennifer Zapp with West County Health Centers, Inc., Shauna Pena, with the Wyoming Department of Health Frontier, and Andrea Ruggiero with Open Door Family Medical Centers. And they will join us at the end of the presentation to share their succession planning journey. But before we do that, Andrea will share her experience with monitoring and adjusting her organization's succession plan for effectiveness. After Andrea's presentation, Jenny and Shauna will join us for the live Q&A session. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide has the contact uh, information for Lieutenant Commander Lemons and I. Next slide, please. Please feel free to drop your questions and comments in the chat, or you can hold them for the Q&A session. Next slide, please. We will also hold, we will also hold this scenario for the Q&A session. We will leave it up for a few seconds so you can uh, get a quick look. Next slide, please. 
on behalf of Lieutenant Commander Lemons and I, thank you all so much for your participation, but the session is not over. We will hear from Andrea with Open Door for the recipient's perspective, after which we look forward to a lively conversation during the Q&A session. Next slide, please. You may access the links in this slide to learn more about our Ryan White HIV AIDS program and to sign up for the program's list serve. Next slide, please. Use the links in this slide to learn more about our agency and to sign up for the HRSA e-news. Please follow us on Facebook, X, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my honor and pleasure to turn the presentation over to Andrea Rugario with Open Door Family Medical Center for a recipient's perspective on succession planning. Andrea? Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Andrea Ruggiero, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Community Health for the Open Door Family Medical Center. I'm so grateful for the chance to share how we've incorporated many of the strategies we heard about today into our succession planning approach. Let me introduce you to Open Door, a federally qualified health center located in Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess, and Ulster counties outside of New York City. Our mission is to ensure that healthcare is accessible to all, regardless of one's ability to pay. We are dedicated to providing high quality services to our patients. Next slide, please. Open Door was founded in the basement of the Ossining First Baptist Church in 1972 with about a thousand patients. In 1990, our HIV case management program was established. Next slide, please. Open Door has continued to grow and expand its reach and scope of services. Next slide, please. We currently operate seven health centers and nine school-based health centers. Next slide, please. As a federally qualified health center, we offer a range of services, including medical, dental, behavioral health, various specialty services like vision and enabling services such as case management for our HIV program, along with other support services for our patients. Next slide, please. This slide is just a little snapshot of the significant impact that our programs have on the communities that we serve. Next slide, please. At Open Door, we serve low-income, uninsured, and underinsured populations, underserved minorities, high-risk populations, and of course, women of childbearing age and their children. In 2023, 208 patients received services through our Ryan White program. Next slide, please. This is just to give a little picture of all of the different um, awards and recognition that we've received at Open Door. Next slide, please. For non for profit organizations such as Open Door, it's crucial to preserve institutional knowledge and ensure continuity of care. Next slide, please. Our aim is to establish a systematic plan for succession planning should a lead role become vacant, which is why we've developed a staff advancement strategy targeting high achieving and high potential employees. Next slide, please. The best ways to support high performers is to identify specific roles and projects to provide targeted opportunities so that they can acquire needed skills. It is incredibly important to identify coaching opportunities so that those staff members feel supported by management. Next slide, please. At Open Door, we utilize the end of year reviews and performance management process to create strategies 
for enhancing the potential successor skills. These end of year reviews are complementary to their job competencies. The year end evaluation procedure provides us a chance to assess employees readiness for promotions. Next slide, please. Frequent recognition of a staff member as outstanding should prompt managers to consider them for a promotion. While most people will fall into the successful category, managers are expected to continue to develop these staff and provide them with regular feedback to encourage growth. Next slide, please. Being thorough and specific when pointing out strengths is essential. It's important that they receive feedback that's both clear and structured. In this example, the manager points out that the staff member is goal-oriented, that they are monitoring progress to targets, and that they maintain a balanced focus on both quality and productivity. Next slide, please. It is also essential for employees to be informed about areas that require additional development. This part of the performance evaluation offers feedback on where they have the potential to grow their abilities. Additionally, this section can mention particular training opportunities. Next slide, please. It's essential to address the various facets of succession planning, immediate exit strategies, a plan for three to five years from now, and the capability for growth of a department. For sudden departures, having someone ready to assume key duties is crucial. With advanced planning, a structured development plan can ensure that potential successors receive adequate training to fulfill the role effectively. Next slide, please. Transfers and promotions effectively maintain staff satisfaction and retention. With open doors growth, the necessity to evaluate essential qualifications for specific roles has intensified. Typically, an employee is required to serve in their current role for a minimum of one year to qualify for a transfer or promotion, although exceptions exist for those who already possess the necessary qualifications. Next slide, please. Earlier, it was emphasized that pinpointing a talent pipeline is crucial. Staff promotions are vital and must hinge on an individual's qualifications, past performance, leadership potential, education, preparation, and their ability to execute duties com competently. Next slide, please. Offering staff development and training opportunities is also fundamental for growth. At Open Door, employees are required to complete annual mandatory trainings via an online learning system. These trainings are tailored to the individual's present role, but additional courses are available for those interested in acquiring new skills. Additional training topics might include providing effective feedback, performance management, and how to develop SMART goals. Next slide, please. Given the high value placed on staff education and training, Open Door sponsors an educational assistance program for its employees. The program aims to offer reimbursements to staff members who incur expenses from participating in educational courses that are pertinent to their job responsibilities at Open Door. Next slide, please. This slide portrays the positive outcomes of effective success succession planning as evidenced by enhanced staff retention, job satisfaction, and program stability. My journey with Open Door began in 2004 when I joined as an HIV test counselor and case manager. During my tenure at Open Door, I had the opportunity to hone my skills and progress in the healthcare field. 
over the past two decades through consistent feedback and the support to pursue further education, earning a master's degree in public administration while still employed at the open door, I rose to the position of Executive Vice President of Community Health in 2020. I hope that this presentation has shown a little bit of how succession planning can really reinforce wonderful outcomes in any organization. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you everyone for joining. Before we begin our Q&A session, we would like to thank our presenters for addressing this timely and interesting topic. At this time, we will pose questions from attendees that we have been collecting throughout the presentation. Please note that you may still submit questions using the chat feature. You may still share your responses um, via the chat feature uh, with regards to any questions that are posed or if you have additional comments to add. Questions should be relevant to the scope of today's presentation. If you have questions directly related to your specific program and today's topic, we ask that you discuss with your project officer following the conference. For more information related to client eligibility, please refer to HRSA PCN 2102. Um, information related to Ryan White service categories, PCN 1602. Uh, and information related to CQM, please refer to HRSA PCN 1502. All right, so now we're going to ask all of our panelists to come on camera. And we do have a few questions that we have received from Q&A as well as in the chat. So I will turn it over to our chat room monitor and she will um, share questions and ask for each of our panelists to join and share their input if they have any. Thank you, uh, Commander Lemons. Um, we will uh, open the floor up to our panelists. So uh, Andrea, Shauna, or Jenny, who, whichever you would like to start first, or maybe we'll start with uh, Jenny uh, to share your experience um, with succession planning. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, my experience is relatively new. Uh, we had our site visit for our uh, West County Health Centers in 2023. And that was one of our findings. And to be honest, I didn't know anything about succession planning. I didn't know what it was. I had not heard of it. Um, and as far as I knew, our agency had not done any planning um, with any of our employees. So I was kind of starting um, from scratch. Uh, I found it really interesting, honestly, because I really dove into my position. And it was specifically for me. Um, for the HIV program manager, that's what they were mostly concerned about. I was the only person that mostly knew what I did um, and only person doing that specific, specific job. Uh, and so I listed all of my um, different tasks that I do, talked to our HR department about who uh, would possibly do those different tasks because they varied. They weren't all necessarily administrative um, I also do data entry in our careware program and in the ARIES. Um, so it really involved many departments at our agency to figure out who would in the event that I couldn't come to work or I retired or um, I uh, left the agency for any reason, um, who would do those tasks and how often they need to be done and where can they find the folders that house the reports and sort of interesting how many things I do um, and how many things needed to be covered by multiple employees, not just one. Uh, and so that was really probably the most interesting part. My succession plan ended up being six pages long, uh, listing everything I do, um, all the places that people can find things and which staff member would do those. It's a little different than what uh, was shown today. This was a great presentation um, for anyone who hasn't done them yet, because it was really hard for me to figure out how to start to do one. Um, but I definitely feel like it's going to help out our agency. I still need to bring it to HR and figure out 
training. I think one of the most um, challenging parts is training people for a position that they won't be doing right away. Uh, and if they're going to be the same people in that position, if the event happens that I can't attend um, my job uh, for whatever reason. And so there may need to be more training in the future, depending on if there's turnover in those positions. Um, but I feel like if you have a company or an agency that really fosters training and support that they're able to do that for you. And if they really work together, um, you'll, you'll find that people are actually interested in what you do and, um, and are happy to support you. So that's kind of been my experience. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Shauna, I'll ask you to share, uh, provide your uh, experience now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So in Wyoming, which is where I am from, our Part C is at the state level. And so we have an almost an extra layer of challenges sometimes when you're talking about all of the procedures and policies that are associated with that. One thing I did learn when I, so I've been um, overseeing our Ryan White Part B and Part C, which are kind of intertwined in a way, um, is that I've been overseeing it for about a year and a half now. And then our Part C coordinator um, moved to another position. And so part of that was even though she left kind of like a uh, small handbook or something like that, one thing that we did not do is as she left is we didn't walk through the processes that she wrote down and how she um, how she saw things were a little different than how other people process things. And so the challenges, the biggest challenges we had with um, succession planning was that her the notes she left were very hard to understand and they didn't, like I said, jive with how a lot of us think. Um, so I think one of the biggest lessons we learned is as you have somebody or as they're working on maybe their succession plan or a handbook or something like that, walk through the steps that they're putting out, have somebody double check that to see that, um, you know, for the, for the job itself on what that looks like. Um, as for, you know, like I said, being at a state level and a state agency um, under the Department of Health is that we can, we work really hard to make sure that we're training everybody um, between, you know, on the different jobs so that there's some of that um, continuity of care but it can be a challenge to say, hey, the plan is for you to take this job because we have to open it up or we have to be, we, a lot of times we have to open those positions up to outside sources. And so you, it can be a challenge to just do an internal hire or an internal promotion. Because um, even to do that, you have to have it open for at least three days, um, that kind, you know, so there's just all those policies and procedures that you have to be aware of, uh, so that you're not, so that you're making sure you're within the, you're not going to get in trouble. But I think the biggest lesson we learned, like I said, is that as you have somebody that's kind of writing out their job duties and saying what the most important thing is, is not only have those conversations, but test the steps to make sure that they're understandable for everybody and that it translates, um, how to everybody's language. Thank you, Shauna, so much uh, uh, for sharing. Andrea? Hi, I think I see a couple of questions on the chat that I'm happy to answer. Um, uh, one of the questions is about um, how many employees Open Door has, and we have about 460 um, employees, full-time employees at Open Door, so it's a pretty large organization, but our, our systems are pretty standard across the organization. So regardless if it's our HIV program, our, you know, care coordination, or any of the other programs ac across the organization, our, our procedure is pretty much the same. And so we have um, HR that really drives our end of year review process. And so that process starts um, all the way at the end of January and end of year reviews are expected to be um, completed by March. And so there's a little window of time when, you know, supervisors are provided time to really examine 
um, all of their team members and assess for all of the you know qualities that we talked about today. Um, certainly, we're looking for you know top performers, and we want to reward those top performers. We want to incentivize them to stay, provide those opportunities that we've heard about today. Um, over over time, I think that we've developed a lot of those you know little even mini incentives where you know. Um, overachieving staff are provided with, you know, uh, additional training opportunities, opportunities to travel to conferences, opportunities to really develop what they feel passionate about. And so um, I think that's a great um, process that has really developed over time at Open Door. And certainly it has sort of, you know, um, I would say improved year over year. So even though this process probably started way, you know, maybe 10 plus years, I think that as the organization has continued to grow and expand its um, scope of work, we've also made sure that we are able to continue to retain those staff, especially the ones that we know will impact the way that service delivery is done across the organization. All righty. Thank you, uh, Andrea. And uh, let, let me uh, we'll read now uh, one of the questions that was uh, posed uh, in the Q and A uh, section, it asks, "Do you recommend identifying and announcing the specific individual that you plan to be the successor?" And part B of that question, um, I'll hold until um, until you answer. So, yeah, we would love to hear from our recipients, our, our panelists, rather. Um, as a project officer, of course, I may be looking at it from a different perspective. So we definitely want to get your thoughts from a recipient perspective. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to announce your successor um, 10 years prior? I can answer that um, just from what I think. Uh, I tend to try to lean on positions and departments rather than people, um, especially if it's gonna be that far in advance. Um, yes, you may end up training certain people in those departments to uh, kind of understand what your roles are, um, but I'm not sure naming some specific person is a good idea because who knows if they're even going to be there in 10 years. Um, I've been at our agency for 20 years and I've seen many, many, many people come and go. Um, and so I think it it tends to be a little hard for that person as well because the expectation is that they would take okay. over your job while still doing possibly their job, um, even temporarily. And so I think focusing on a department rather than a person is, if you can, would be the way to go. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, a second uh, participant uh, attendee asked, uh, we are finding that our existing positions are doing the work of more than one person when replaced. There is no additional funding to pay for more positions. What are your suggestions in this situation? So Andrea, Jenny, or Shauna, please. So I'll I'll just jump in. Um, I think, you know, how we've tried to manage this is try to sort of divide some of the um some of the responsibilities um, across different members of the team. Um, we, you know, I, I feel that as a supervisor, as a manager, you do have a good sense of what your team members are really good at. And so if you are able to, um, you know, really harness their skills and being able to sort of divvy up the responsibilities um, that meet their own skill set, their own passion, it makes it a little bit easier, which we've had to do um, when, you know, a staff member even goes on medical leave and you've had to even temporarily divide responsibilities. You really need to look to see who the, the best members of the team and which ones are really going to be able to take on some additional responsibilities and not get burned out. So it is, you know, it's, it's, it's a it's a challenge. Um, it's not an easy thing to have to do that, but certainly, you know, you do um, you do the best that you can. And luckily, I, th I do think we've been very blessed that um, so many people within our organization has really have really stuck it out and 
feel committed to the work and, you know, they, they really do communicate when they're starting to feel like they're sort of at that limit um, and they need additional support. So they do voice when they need some additional support. And then we as managers have to go back and figure out how to respond to that because the last thing we want is to lose another you know capable staff member. Ah, thank you, Andrea. We also uh, see Stephanie has her hand uh, raised. Uh, can we unmute uh, Stephanie? Stephanie? Her question is in the chat. In the chat, okay. All Are right. there any training or other professional development resources you can recommend that are free or very low cost if the organization has a modest training budget? Uh, and Sean, I saw you were about to come off of mute. So would you like to take this question? Sure can. Um, so I know one is there's a Vanderbilt, there is a clinical, there is a case, clinical case management training that is good for even at the state level. Um, I just completed that. It has like motivational interviewing in it. It has um, just a basic understanding of, well, I wouldn't say basic understanding. It has a very detailed, it's like 27 modules. So it takes some time, but it is a really good training. Like I said, I just completed it to help with my learning, has mental health and substance abuse training and what that looks like. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's for the state, but it's just that how, you know, to have a better understanding of when we're to working with the clients, what that can look like. Um, then there's usually an AETC that's um, in the specific areas that you can look for trainings around that. Those are trainings we do along with my art in our unit, we actually have a monthly um, case manager meeting that we try to talk with the case managers also along with our providers on the services they're providing. We meet with them pretty regularly in order to have and see if they have any additional trainings they need. Um, and then at some time, it, we also try to leverage our um we do get with the Part C the uh, some rebates, and so we'll try to leverage the rebates in order to maybe get some trainings done for the clinic staff and some different staff around that. Um, but that is always a challenge. I would also recommend maybe talking with your your um, other Part C agencies or counterparts and other either in the same state or a different state or something like that, and see if there's a way to collaborate in between trainings too to really grow those kinds of things. And also gives that collaboration and talking about, so here's a challenge we have. One of the biggest challenges in Wyoming we have also is that we're low, we're low morbidity, low, um, um, you know, we don't have a lot of persons living with HIV. So that really puts in that extra challenge of making sure we have the right resources and services available for the clientele that we do have. So I hope that answered that question. Excellent, thank you. And again, we appreciate you all and all of your wonderful comments. I believe we have responded to uh, several of the questions from Open Door, uh, or excuse me, directed at Open Door. Uh, and so with that said, I will say, oh, here's one, Open Door, uh, Andrea, how have you addressed adjustments to compensation from high performing staff as they learn, develop new skills? So, um... I would say we've we've really garnished a lot of support from you know leadership and board. Um, so we have been able to consistently provide merit increases uh, based on the successful and outstanding ratings for staff over the last you know ten plus years. And so that has sort of remained a consistent process for us, even though that range may vary depending on how the you know the organization performs and so we're very transparent with the staff about how the organization you know did um in in that you know year and so we are able to really manage sort of the um expectations of what may be you know not the best successful rating plus merit and outstanding. And that's why I think, you know, while we we really make sure that we are, you know, 
supporting the staff financially, we are still creating those additional incentive programs through training and other opportunities for them to develop so that it's not just contingent on a merit or you know bonus potential but hopefully you know those are you know add-ons that we're able to do and i know this is you know not feasible at every single organization and so sometimes getting creative with these um incentive programs is really really important and i think that you know um you the showing people that they are valuable to you in one way or another, I think has made a big, big difference to us, even in the toughest moments where the organization has struggled. You know, we've we just got through a pandemic. So it's it's been challenging, but certainly the staff who remain committed, especially within our HIV program, have been here for a long, long time. And they see that, you know, the the good of the organization and the, the good that they're doing is is very much appreciated by leadership as a whole. Excellent. Thank you. We have another good question from Gretchen. Have you encountered, and this is open to all any of the panelists, I believe, have you encountered individuals who view succession planning as a threat, meaning training someone to do their job function is a threat to their security or status, and how have you dealt with it? I'll start. So with um, our office is an office of like four, and then I make like the fifth. So we really focus on how to be a team um, with that and how to, we talk a lot about cross training and we call it, you know, cross training because if, for example, right now there's three of the five that are in DC right now for the conference. So there's two people in the office right now trying to man manage the office. And we have to keep services going. We have to pay, keep payments going. We have to keep everything moving. And so we talk a lot about cross-training in order to make sure that that just everything can keep moving and that nothing falls through the cracks. So we don't necessarily call it succession planning, but more cross-training so that somebody can be gone. Somebody can go on vacation. Um, somebody can have an emergency and not feel the overwhelmed necessarily when they come back. So that's kind of how we address it at our level. Uh, thank you, Shauna. Commander, we have an, we have um, questions that's posed, uh, and I'm going to uh, read it as it's written. It says, my organization has a long history of key position staff retiring with no succession plan in place, including leadership position. I was hired a few years ago um, to one of those positions. We have two key positions with folks who could retire at any moment. Um, and there perhaps is some resistance uh, to discussing succession planning and transparency around the future plans. Um, as the program manager, how do I handle this? How do I prepare for this? Any of our panelists, please. I think that's really hard. Um, I think you're probably going to need to reach out to people beyond your department and and get some support from leadership and HR. And that's usually what I find is if people are resistant in their position, as much as we believe that we own the positions that we're in, um, they'll be there long after we retire or leave that job. And those tasks and those positions really belong to that agency. Uh, and so they may need to be a little bit um, encouraged to participate in that transition, but I always try to go to um, to leadership if you have that support. Absolutely, and encouraging uh, folks to think about others, think about the care that may be missed if indeed they do not share the historical knowledge with persons coming after them and how it just creates, it's ultimately hurting the clients that we serve uh, by not sharing that information. So thanks, Jen. All right, Marva, back over to you. Thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, asks, our company has shifted to a matrix 
of uh, management approach. This creates teams for tasks with project lead, who is the primary subject matter expert. Uh, this disseminates knowledge across uh, multiple individuals. It is also, okay, so someone is sharing. It is also, it also familiarizes uh, more than one staff with a task. So that's an approach. Uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and someone is asking, Shauna, can you share the Vanderbilt link? So we will try to get that. Uh, it's already in the chat. Thank you. Does either panelists have experience uh, engaging in succession planning through an equity lens, race, gender, et cetera? If so, what strategies do you use? And uh, what did you learn from your efforts? Andrea, Jenny, or Shauna? Well, it's certainly okay if we don't have answers right away. Um, please note that we will be collecting all of the questions from this um, this presentation or from this session, and we will work to develop uh, a sort of a FAQ document that can be shared at a later date. So thank you for your question. Um, and again, if someone feels comfortable with answering that, please chime in and do so. Um, one of our panelists. If not, we're going to move on. Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. This is moving very quickly. I'm trying to uh, keep track of all the questions. One second. Let me get back over to the Q&A section. So I have, I see one in the uh, chat. Okay. What are some incentives that can be utilized among bargaining union employees when monetary or individual incentives are limited under collective bargaining agreements? So I, I can start with a few um, ideas and, and a few different positions, especially some of the very difficult positions to hire and retain. Um, you know, if it's not financial, it can be, you know, time off, uh, paid time off or providing someone, if possible, within their role, um, a hybrid work schedule, um, a more um, a flexible work schedule. If Again, you know, it's, it's all contingent on the role and whether someone is able to do this and still be able to deliver services to the clients and patients. But certainly, you know, sort of getting creative with those pay time off strategies, those are incentives that while they're in a way financial, they're not necessarily you paying outright, you know, a higher salary or, you know, um, sign on or retention bonuses, which are, you know, another strategy, but those are more obviously monetary based. So those are, are you know, some strategies that have worked for a few positions where it's been feasible to hire with those um, you know, with those flexibilities. Uh, thank you, Andrea. The next uh, question, is, uh, question asks, has succession planning for your organization led to reorganization of positions in the past? For example, was it discovered that an employee was doing more labor than the scope of their role, leading to creating new a new role to uh, delegate responsibilities? And while you're pondering that question and deciding if um, you're going to be responding in this session, then another question asks, when it comes to cross-training, how do you handle staff who are resistant to learn their duties outside their role because that is not the job that uh, they were hired to do? I feel like I can speak a little bit to the second one more than the first. Um, I think it really just shows how selective you have to be on who you choose uh, to be involved in the succession planning. Because if it if their role really isn't connected to what you do, or even uh, outside of your department, I mean, I was really careful to think 
who really does this work, even though it's not specifically what I do, but around that kind of work that are comfortable learning those things and, and are in a leadership role to understand that they would have to support my position if it became available for one reason or another. So um, I think it's, and it's also kind of the culture of the agency. Um, if a lot of people are given a lot of tasks all the time that they don't feel appropriate, having another task put on their list will be difficult. So um, so I, it definitely has to do with how the agency does things and, and who you select to be involved in your transition plan. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that question, Jenny. I'm looking for another one. Well, Ms. Marva, thank you. I think we have two minutes left and we want to make yes, sure that do. all of our folks get a chance to join us at the meet and greet taking okay. place at 1.30. So um, before we end, first of all, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending the session. Thank you for your participation and your questions. All very good. Um, on the next screen, you will see a QR code. Please scan this code in our technical review uh, or excuse me, our technical crew will guide you through the 2024 Business Day evaluation. Your participation is greatly appreciated. Again, all of the questions that we did not get to in the chat, we will certainly uh, work to provide some responses and figure out the best way to get that out to those who are interested. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, this presentation will be available via uh, Target HIV website shortly following the conference. Um, these slides are being presented or have been shared via the chat. Um, and so with that being said, again, we'll ask that you please scan the QR code, let our technical crew guide you through the, through, uh, the 2024 business day evaluation. We appreciate your participation. If you've already taken the evaluation, you do not need to take it again. Thank our panelists, Jennifer Zapp. Um, Andrea Rigario and Shauna Pena for your time and sharing on today. <laughs> Thank you so much. And again, we appreciate your, your uh, contributions and interest in this session. Have a great day.